from London. This is The World Today. Hello, I'm Sally Burdett. Thank you for joining us. Our top stories this hour. The Israeli military dismisses two officers and disciplines three others for their roles in the airstrike that killed seven foreign aid workers in Gaza. Israel says it will open two more humanitarian aid routes into Gaza following pressure from the United States. Iran says it will punish Israel over its alleged role in the killing of seven officers in a strike on its embassy in Syria. Fears of global manufacturing overcapacity as US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen begins her second trip to China. Israel's military says the attack on a convoy of international aid workers was a case of mistaken identity. The IDF says two officers have been dismissed and three reprimanded over the deadly attack which killed seven staff working for the NGO World Central Kitchen. The army said intelligence and operational failures had resulted in one of the passengers being mistaken for a gunman. Poland has demanded Israel conduct a criminal inquiry into what it called the murder of one of its citizens. Meanwhile, the UN Human Rights Council has passed a resolution calling for Israel to be held accountable for possible war crimes in Gaza. It's also demanding a halt to all arms sales to Israel. Well, let's speak now to Alex Kadia in Tel Aviv. Alex, thanks uh, for talking to us today. Aid workers give out their coordinates in advance precisely to avoid this horrific situation. What details does the Israeli military report give us about what on earth went wrong? Well, the military commission concluded that a series of mistakes were behind this uh, tragedy. Uh, communication breakdowns, a misidentification of targets, and the breach of protocol. And as you very rightly said, the World Central Kitchen teams had told the IDF where they were, where they were traveling, when they were moving, and on IDF-approved routes. What this commission has found out is that that information was not relayed to the commanders on the ground. So that was one of the mistakes. Of course, the other one, the misidentification of targets. The Israeli Defense Forces saying that they had identified uh, one or two armed men on the convoy and that uh, that man traveled with the convoy on a truck. But when the three cars left the warehouse, they were without the truck and without the armed man. Despite this, the drone fired a rocket at the first car and when they were still not able to identify any armed uh, men, uh, they uh, fired a rocket at the second and then the third car. And that is what is being described as a breach of protocol against the IDF rules. But clearly, a lot of accountability still needed. Jose Andres, the founder of World Central Kitchen, uh, saying that he wants to see an independent commission. We also know that the United States is still asking for answers. And we heard uh, just earlier today from Anthony Blinken about that very point. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. It's also important that it appears to be taking steps to hold those responsible uh, accountable. Uh, even more important is making sure that steps are taken going forward to ensure that something like this can never happen again. There is growing pressure on Israel. Have they responded to what the UN Human Rights Council, uh, their resolution calling for a halt to arms sales to Israel and for Israel to be held accountable for possible war crimes in Gaza? Well, Israel's ambassador at that council said that the United Nations was anti-Israel and supportive of Hamas. We also had reaction from Israel's foreign minister saying that it was an anti-Israel resolution and that it makes no mention of Hamas or its crimes on October 7th and that the res resolution equates Israeli hostages with prisoners in Israel who have been accused of terrorism activity. So clearly a very strong reaction by uh, the Israelis who feel like that resolution was uh, anti-Israeli, biased as you were, but clearly 
uh, that pressure from the United Nations will have a limited impact here in Israel because of the rifts already between uh, certain UN uh, organizations, the UN Human Rights Council and the Israeli government. What may change things, of course, is pressure from the United States. We know that President Biden uh, effectively gave Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a uh, ultimatum in the last 24 hours saying that if more humanitarian aid did not flow into Gaza, the United States would have to condition its military and diplomatic support. We've now seen a reaction from Israel opening up the Erez checkpoint in the north of Gaza for trucks of food and aid to go in, opening up the port of Ashdod to humanitarian supplies and allowing more supplies to flow through Kerem Shalom checkpoint in the south of Gaza. The U.S. says they welcome the move, but they want to see results. All right, thank you so much, Alex Acadia, coming to us live from Tel Aviv. And as Alex mentioned, Israel has agreed to open two routes to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. This follows a phone call between U.S. President Joe Biden and Israel's leader, Benjamin Netanyahu. Let's join Noor Harazin in Rafa. Noor, has there been any reaction to this announcement that is opening new aid routes? Well, talking about Palestinians here, ordinary people on the ground, they were actually scared uh, when uh, this news was announced. And the reason why is because they started talking about maybe this means that Israel will invade the city of Rafah. Maybe the uh, Rafah border will uh, be closed. Uh, the Karm Abu Salem border will be closed. Is this a new humanitarian aid route to open to the Gaza Strip and in a way to invade the city of Rafah. They had all of these uh, very scary uh, questions. They do, people here on the ground, fear the uh, Israeli ground invasion of Rafah. Uh, however, talking about this Israeli decision to open the uh, Ashdod uh, port and also to open the Erez uh, crossing that uh, was uh, closed since the 7th of October, this comes after the uh, phone call between uh, Joe Biden and Netanyahu and uh, a Apparently, in a readout of that uh, call, uh, Joe Biden warned Israel of uh, it must, must uh, take preventions of the killing of civilians. However, reading was happening here on the ground, and according to the Palestinian Health Ministry, 82 Palestinians were killed in Gaza today, and this brought up the death toll here in the coastal enclave up, up to uh, 33,120 uh, Palestinians. 75 of them are children children and women. Horrific stats. The UN Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, is saying that people in northern Gaza are surviving on less than 12 percent of their average daily calories. Talk to us about the food situation, how people are coping. Well, yes, the situation is just going from bad to worse. Even here, talking about cities in the south, I am in Rafah city, and the situation is just getting harder uh, every uh, single uh, day that passes. I mean, there is less aid that is entering Gaza, even though there is uh, weekly reports from the UN, the Oxfam, the World Health Organization, the UNICEF. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, weekly reports about the famine in Gaza, about the uh, malnutrition here in the coastal enclave. However, what is happening on the ground is that rarely there is any changes. But uh, talking about some of the highlights, actually today um, a number of food trucks were allowed to the uh, north of uh, the Gaza Strip. Most of these trucks were loaded with vegetables and uh, fruits, specifically bananas. And this is the first time since the 7th of October where bananas is allowed to northern Gaza. However, uh, these fruits and vegetables are being sold at a very expensive price. We are talking about uh, 9 to $10 per kilogram of uh, uh, the fruits or vegetables. Again, this is a very, very expensive uh, price. Uh, while Palestinians since the 7th of October have been suffering in this deteriorating question, uh, uh, situation, we are talking about the stopping of salaries, uh, no uh, working businesses. So, yes, the situation is just going uh, from bad uh, to worse. Noor Harazin in Gaza there. Now, Iran has repeated its pledge to punish Israel for the deaths of seven officers killed in a suspicious
expected Israeli airstrike on Tehran's consulate in Syria. The funeral was held on the annual Al-Quds Day, which has been marked on the last Friday of Ramadan each year since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. It's an international day during which Iran stages large state-sponsored pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli rallies. Today, April 5th, International Quds Day is being commemorated in cities across Iran as well as in many other Muslim countries. But the Quds Day or Jerusalem Day is an annual pro-Palestinian ceremony uh, held uh, on the last Friday uh, of the Islamic uh, Holy Month of Ramadan, expressing support for Palestinians and uh, opposing Israel and Zionism. Uh, this year's rallies are different from previous years as a few days ago in an unprecedented move uh, Israel targeted Iran's consulate building in Syria, capital Damascus and killed seven members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, two of them high-ranking commanders. Uh, I'm currently in the southern Iranian port city of Bandar Abbas and as you can see behind me, angry people are chanting anti-Israel slogans. Uh, today, a funeral procession is being held in the Iranian capital, Tehran, before the Friday prayers at the University of Tehran. Uh, the bodies of the military advisors will then be transferred to uh, their respective provinces and cities for burial. Uh, Iranian officials, in particular the supreme leader, have vowed uh, retaliation against Israel's aggression. On Wednesday, uh, Supreme Leader and uh, Commander-in-Chief Ayatollah Ali Khamenei uh, had said Israel will receive a slap in the face for the recent attack. Uh, therefore, many are expecting a punitive attack on Israel by Iran or anti-Israel armed groups. Meanwhile, uh, the Israeli military has been on high alert since Monday's targeting of Iran's diplomatic complex. Ehsan Keivani, CGTN, Bandar Abbas. All right, so now let's continue with a look at global news. Rescue efforts continue in Taiwan. More than a dozen people are still missing after Wednesday's powerful earthquake. Survivors from the 7.4 magnitude quake, which struck the mountainous and sparsely populated eastern county of Hualien, have been airlifted to safety. Search crews are facing the threat of further landslides and rockfalls. The death toll from Taiwan's worst earthquake in 25 years has risen to 12. At least 1,000 people were injured. Cuba says it secured enough food to feed its population after shortages led to protests last month. The government says it can guarantee basic items like rice until the end of June and is working to secure supplies of other essentials. Cuba has long given its citizens monthly food rations but has been hit hard by US sanctions and the pandemic. Anti-coup forces in Myanmar have launched an unprecedented drone attack on the capital, Napidor. The National Unity Government, which was formed to oppose the 2021 coup, said it had launched drone attacks on two military targets in the capital, the centre of the army's power. Military-run state TV said it shot down 13 fixed-wing drones in what they described as a foiled attack by terrorists. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen meets China's vice premier in Zhuangzhou. We'll have the latest. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans, grey rhinos, and unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTF. I think it should be more global cooperation. I would like to hear more the voice of the developing countries. Globalization has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The green transition has to happen. It's, it's, it's a necessity. 
But China and, and the United States are, are important powers in the world. What unites us is much more than what uh, divides us. And I believe China is committed to this agenda. Join me, Juliet Mann, to set the agenda at these times every weekend on CPTN. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why, this is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Welcome back. A reminder of our headlines. The Israeli military dismisses two officers and disciplines three others for their role in the airstrike that killed seven foreign aid workers in Gaza. Israel says it will open two more humanitarian aid routes into Gaza following pressure from the United States. The U.S. Treasury Secretary kicked off her visit to China by calling for Beijing to provide a level playing field for foreign companies and ease back on production in some sectors. Speaking in the city of Guangzhou, Janet Yellen said that China's manufacturing of certain goods was beyond what the global market can bear. Janet Yellen told business leaders that overcapacity was a problem that had recently intensified. Earlier this year, China said that claims of overcapacity were groundless and unfair. I believe we have taken up the challenge from our leaders to put the U.S.-China relationship on a more solid footing. As I have said, the United States seeks a healthy economic relationship with China that benefits both sides. But a healthy relationship must provide a level playing field for firms and workers in both countries. CGTN's Zheng Chunying has the latest from Guangzhou. U.S. Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen has just wrapped up her first full-day meeting in China's manufacturing hub, Guangzhou, uh, where she met with Vice Premier Ho Lifeng and held talks with him. Uh, although not much details has been released by Chinese authorities yet, there are some highly anticipated and hotly discussed issues on the agenda. Uh, for example, uh, including some of the disagreements between the two sides, um, like the broadening of U.S.'s technological restrictions on Chinese companies and on the U.S.'s side, what Yellen claims China's industrial overcapacity will also likely be raised. And apart from these, during the meetings, Yellen uh, is also expected to seek more opportunities for cooperation with China on issues like countering illicit finance, or bolstering financial stability, addressing climate change, uh, and resolving debt distress in the, some of the developing countries. And earlier this morning, the secretary also met with uh, some economic experts and uh, business representatives from the U.S. enterprises as well. And looking ahead, there is also a very uh, packed schedule for Secretary Yellen in China. Uh, she's going to travel to Beijing and uh, another three full days of meetings at her hat, uh, where she's going to meet with other high-level Chinese officials, including Premier Li Qiang, Finance Minister Lan Fuan, uh, People's Bank of China, Governor uh, Pan Gongsheng, and so on. And the U.S.'s Treasury Secretary's travel comes right after U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping had their first call in five months on Tuesday. Uh, according to some of the experts that I've spoken to, they believe that uh, it was meant to demonstrate a return to regular leader-to-leader -leader dialogue between the two uh, powers. And let's not forget that there had been almost a year's break in communication between the two powers till President Biden and President Xi Jinping met last year in San Francisco. And this is Yellen's second trip since then. So her trip uh, is believed to add to the stability in the China-U.S. relationship, given a sense that communications can continue even amid uh, so many disagreements between the two sides. 
New online tools are helping to save lives in the Austrian Alps. Hikers and skiers can use the apps to look for safe routes through the mountains and avoid potential hazards. Our correspondent Johannes Pleschberger reports. Dying in an avalanche when going off piste is still possible, but less likely. Deadly accidents are actually decreasing. Uh, because uh, there is so much information and people are so much more aware of it. In the past years, the number of free riders and tourers in the Alps has doubled, while avalanche related deaths have slightly declined. This is partly thanks to online tools like Skitouren Guru, which show skiers a safe route through dangerous snow patches. Those new apps bring us a lot of safety because they uh, have a lot of information in it, so we know how dangerous it is, how steep it is, and, yeah, and it's super easy to use. But even the best prepared can end up in an avalanche. Radios to locate and shovels to free victims are standard equipment. But witnesses are often overwhelmed and in shock. Austria now offers a new virtual reality simulator that lets users practice for such an emergency. After virtually packing the necessary items, a buried person has to be located and excavated. For now, the German language Notfalllawine app is only accessible with VR glasses. However, even though the risk of dying in snow masses is decreasing, one factor remains constant. Almost all deadly avalanche victims are male. Experts say women tend to be more aware of risky behavior. Johannes Blechberger, CGTN. Goldeck Mountain in Austria. China's Qingming or Tomb Sweeping Festival in April is also the prime season for the country's tea growers. It's the start of the spring harvest when the price of tea reaches its peak. Chang Tzu Wen reports from China's eastern Zhejiang province. This part of eastern China has a history of tea farming going back 150 years. More than 300 types of tea have been produced here. It's tea harvest season for farmers here. It's the busiest time of the year. The price of tea varies each day, and it's also a race against times. For Chunjian County, East China's Zhejiang province, which has over 1,600 acres of tea land, farmers are working in full swing to embrace the spring harvest. There are 30 cooperatives in Chunjian County which rely on tea farming to generate income. Making green tea is complicated, involving multiple processes. Local residents work around the clock to harvest the tea. Due to the heavy workload, most of the tea processing has moved from human hands to machines, which has greatly increased productivity. 26-year-old Ping Jiayi grew up in this town. Her grandparents own acres of tea farming land. She used to watch them roast tea leaves by hand, selling them in the market and working day and night. In 2019, Ping quit her job in Shanghai and came home to open the community's first tea store, transforming an old warehouse into a tea factory. Our town has more than 1,500 acres of tea farming land, and every household owns some acres of tea farming land. But every household has different picking and tea making standards. People just sell to the local market. Farmers don't have the right to set the price. After I came back, I gathered all the tea farmers to set the standards for picking and making tea unifying the brand and sale channel, which increased tea farmers' profits. The tea industry created 5,000 jobs in Chunjian County, and the profits from tea farming are set to account for over one-third of the income earned by local residents. In 2020, drone technology was used for the first time to monitor farmland, and the Chunjian tea industry also received government subsidies. A year later, spring tea output exceeded 130 million yuan. 
We have the Smart T-Land strategy, which has been carried out in three aspects. The first is to have a database of all basic information on the tea farming land. The second is to use new technology like sensing, drip irrigation, drones to give analysis on seedlings, improving soil and air quality, analyzing pests and diseases, controlling every aspect of cultivation. The third are internet cells, which are traceable. People can trace where the tea is grown. Now, the local government wants to combine tea culture and tourism. The 2020 Chinese hit TV series Nothing But 30 was filmed in Chunjian County. There are also plans to start tea study tours and enable visitors to experience making tea. The air is filled with the delightful aroma of tea, which means it's time to take the first sip of this year's fresh brew and have a taste of spring. Wang Suwen, Cityton, Chunjian County, Zhejiang Province. A UK company hoping to launch the first solar farm into space has passed a critical milestone with a prototype on Earth. Space Solar says it plans to power more than a million homes by the 2030s. The concept requires solar panels, similar to those used on Earth but in orbit, to turn sunlight into electricity, which is then converted to microwaves to be beamed from space to an Earth station connected to the local grid. The company says if successful, it would produce more renewables than terrestrial equivalents. A Japanese startup that specializes in the removal of space junk is said to be considering a listing on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Sources say Astroscale has been speaking to overseas investors to gather feedback before making a decision. The company is developing technology to remove space debris and extend the life of satellites. Huh? Your headlines again. Israeli military dismisses two officers and disciplines three others for their role in the airstrike that killed seven foreign aid workers in Gaza. Israel says it will open two more humanitarian aid routes into Gaza following pressure from the US. Fears of global manufacturing overcapacity as US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen begins her second trip to China. And that's The World Today. Thank you so much for watching. We're back with more news at the top of the hour. Coming up next, it's World Insight with Chan Wei. From now and all of, from all of the team in London, goodbye. Hello and welcome back to your weather news update. I'm your host today, Mark Regan, and today we'll take a look at Europe's forecast. Now we are going to expect to see some rainfall here across uh, many areas of Europe, mainly over into Central and Eastern Europe at light levels and intensity this Saturday. And then we're also going to see snowfall across the north here. We'll see light or moderate intensity, some areas possibly even some heavy intensity of snowfall, a little bit more so over into Finland here with some of that heavier intensity. But as we get over into uh, Sunday here, we're going to expect to see a lot more clearing up taking place across much of Central Europe down over to portions of the Balkans in the south here. We'll still see rainfall in some areas, uh, but a lot less in terms of that scope. And then with that here, we're going to expect temperatures to be on the rise uh, Saturday and Sunday. So these 25 degree temperatures are going to start to expand and push further over into Central Europe, down over into the Balkans. We're going to continue to see these 20 degree temperatures in many areas. Much cooler though across the north. We'll see day highs there just in the teens or in the upper single digits. And with that here, we'll take a look at our business travel outlook. A little bit cooler in London at 16 for the day highs there, some light rainfall. About 18 in Paris, light rainfall there as well. Uh, 21 day highs in Madrid, we'll see 20 in Lisbon, all that with light rain. And then taking a look out over into Central Europe, we'll see 19 day highs in Brussels with light rain conditions, but much warmer in Berlin here. We'll see 27, 28 day highs for folks in Vienna, and even 23 for folks in Warsaw. That does it for me today. Thanks for watching. Up next is your city forecast. Bye.